I don't know if this is symbolic, but there's a page in front of me here that says that local religion and the cult of relics continue to thrive in late medieval tour. Um, welcome to the uh, SciArc lecture series. Uh, I'd like to thank the student undergraduate lecture committee for helping to organize this event and point out to you that next week Mehmet Sander will give a lecture performance here, same time, same place. I would also like to tell you that after the lecture, we will have a t-shirt signing by Enrique Norton, and he will be design, uh, signing specially designed t-shirts uh, out there where the beer is, so you can accost him there. I uh, have a, a difficult job following up John Kaliski's rather spectacular introduction last week, and I was thinking that I could say that Enrique Norton was really my long last cousin, and that we rediscovered uh, each other when we were both there for the rededication of the synagogue in Hangshu. But it's not really true, and I can't pull it off the way that John Kaliski did. So I'll just tell you that I first heard about Enrique Norton several years ago when I saw the lighting showroom that he had designed in Mexico City, which seemed like this amazing Tokyo-like sliver that was shot through with various shards and metal pieces that seemed to have flown in from Los Angeles. I thought, well, that's pretty hip. And then I realized, God, I think that's pretty hip because I have this idea of Mexico City as this very far away, very ancient, very strange place. And obviously, I want every place to be shot through with my own brand of modernism. So I figured that I'd better go down and investigate. And I finally managed to convince someone that this was a good idea, and I should go down there and look at what Enrique Norton was doing there. And I found this incredibly dense, amazing city. For those of you that have been to Mexico City recently, it's really quite uh, an incredible uh, place to, to find yourself in, especially when you have someone like Enrique Norton as a tour guide. And then he started taking me around, and I suddenly found these concrete cages that were filled with light, and these ephemeral forms that he was designing that would allow street vendors to exist in the city, and orders that seemed to fragment under the very pressure of uh, the sheer density of Mexico City itself. And I discovered that what Enrique is doing, together with a bunch of uh, young, very vital architects there, like uh, Ernesto Kalash and Yitzhak Broid and the people involved with the magazine Architectura, is that they're really creating uh, the future for what has to be our next metropolis. And on a certain level, it doesn't really matter where Enrique Norton is from or where he is. He is from Mexico. He uh, studied at the uh, Universitat Ibero-Americana, but then he got his education at uh, further education at Cornell and now teaches at every place from Rice to Columbia to USC, and of course this semester we're very pleased to have him here at SciArc. And you find him in symposia, conferences, lectures, and publications all around the world. But on the other hand, I think that he does represent a very particular place, a place that not only has its own geography, but does have its very own brand of modernism, a modernism that is at the same time poetic, and uh, filled out with a kind of bravura that's very urbane and forceful, and yet is a very fragile reaction to the modern condition as it has impacted a city like Mexico City. And I think that his forms are forms that could only happen at this time and this place. Richard Rodriguez has said recently that Mexico City is the capital of modernity, and that if that is true, I would say that Enrique Norton is the architect of that modern metropolis. Please help me welcome Enrique Norton. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for this overwhelming introduction. I hope I can keep up to all of that. Uh, well, before I start, I, I want to to make the, the usual thanks uh, to Mike Rotondi, to Aaron, for not only for inviting me to, to lecture here tonight or to show you my work, but also for inviting me to teach at such a, a dynamic in, in a life place as I art. 
Uh, and of course, it's a great responsibility to talk uh, and to show my work in this forum, in this forum, I mean, uh, as it's become such an important place for the, for the uh, investigation of architecture. Uh, but uh, as I have been talking in different places and, and trying to, to make what it's called a lecture, or to show my work in different uh, scenarios, I have found it uh, every time more and more difficult to talk about my own work. Uh, I find it very hard, and it's true, I want to be very sincere about this. Uh, it's harder for me every time I speak to, to, to find the correct words to express the work we are trying to do. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, it should come to a, to a time when uh, we could just have a lecture, a lecture on architecture, uh, be able to be a lecture without words. Uh, I wish that uh, one day I could make a, a, a truly silent lecture where uh, the void of the words get filled by the, by the sounds of the images. Uh, of course, that cannot be totally true because uh, in that case nobody would invite me. I would just show my, send my slides and there would be no reason for me to be here. But I, uh, I do think that, uh, and I do hope, that uh, it becomes more important what I can show you today in the few projects that I have brought than what I can say about those projects. Uh, what I have brought tonight is a collection, a, a selection, a small selection of the projects that we have been doing in our office during the last uh, six or seven years, more or less. Uh, I believe that all of these projects uh, uh, have to be seen as a, as a one body of work, as a one large project, as some kind uh, of a continuity of a project where each of one of these projects is at the same time criticizing and commenting on the other projects. Uh, of course, there are certain themes, uh, certain general themes that uh, will appear and come, up, come out uh, stronger in some of the projects that I would show you. And therefore, I will use those projects to exemplify or to point out uh, certain concerns about our, wor our work that have become uh, some kind of standards and in, th in that way be able to, to explain or, or try to transmit to you uh, what our main motivations in this practice of, act of architecture has become to us. Uh, in, in many times also when I, when I speak, uh, uh, I have found that one of the most interesting parts of, of these uh, encounters are uh, the relationship I establish uh, with the students or with the, uh, my fellow colleagues that attend these, these events. And therefore, uh, I, try to, I will try, and, and I will try to make it today, to show uh, many images. Uh, and then, if it's possible and that it's all right, I'll be very glad to, to discuss any matter that would come up and make it a, a more lively uh, dialectical thing that only a, a one person talking about, about a practice. Uh, so you will be very welcome to, to ask questions or to make commentaries. Uh, I'll, I'll appreciate that very much. Uh, one of the, the, the questions that not only when I speak, but when many of my colleagues speak, rise, is somebody will always ask uh, the speaker uh, if he could define what his work is about. So from the beginning, I can tell you, I cannot tell you what I, my work is about. I, it's very hard to define what my work is about. But uh, I can try to tell you, before I start with the images I have brought, uh, certain things that I wish my work uh, could be about. Uh, I am very much concerned about uh, uh, the, the contemporary times that we're living. And I do wish uh, that our architecture uh, is something that emerges and responds to this time of overabundance. Um, over I, I believe it should be a reaction to squander. It should be a response to overproduction of information. Of course, and I'm totally convinced that architecture is before anything else a will of creation. But I also think, very importantly, 
that architecture is both a political act and a social responsibility. And therefore, we, and when I say we, it's our team, as I believe architecture is a collaborative effort, we relinquish the supposed values of architecture as a communicative, symbolic, historical, or urban system. On the other end, we, we do that for the empirics of our own vocation. We believe, I believe very much, in the material qualities of our discipline, the solidity of architecture. And I think architecture as limited to its strict materiality, rejecting all desire of meaning. And I think we should go immediately and directly to the, to the images, please. That's fine, not I'll burn my fingers. Now I cannot see anything. Okay, the first, the first issue, the first theme I want, to, I want to address or I want to comment with you, and, and by a theme I mean those concerns that I believe are definitive to, to, my, to our architecture, but also to the architecture of our times. And the first theme would be what I call the, the subject of place. Architecture, I believe, is definitely, uh, of, all of, the arts, of all of the arts, the one that is definitely and most strongest rooted to a place. A very close relationship gets established between a place or with, between the object and its locus. Uh, but, and by this, uh, of course, uh, I, I don't mean at all uh, what it's been understood or what it's been uh, learned about a literal contextualism. I don't mean literally a contextualist position. I do think there is a different kind of relationship with a site that has to do uh, with a much more dynamic condition of the relationship with, of architecture and a site, uh, a, a condition of constant transformation. Uh, next, please. Uh, the object and environment establish a very important and a very strong uh, condition. Never, nevertheless, uh, the work, nevertheless of the condition of non-contextualism, uh, the work of architecture loses its meaning if extrapolated out from the place it belongs to. In this first project that I'm going to show you, it's a project that we built in a place very close by to Mexico City called Valle de Bravo. And here we were to build two vacation houses next that are located in a mountain, on the, on the slope of a mountain that surrounds a very beautiful colonial town that at the same time is located next to, to a lake. Of, uh, we got this, uh, this site, and uh, as I said before, these were two houses to be built. But again, the, the very strange place condition is that when we got there, we first got a commission to build one house uh, where our position was to transform the site one time, and when the site was already being transformed or being built, we got a commission again to build the house next, so it was a double transformation of a place that it's, I believe, in constant transformation. Next. The interpretation of the conditions of the place is what has forced uh, or the, what has uh, directed the, the, mean, uh, the means of acting for us in architecture. Uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the tensions that were established between the different elements that already formed the architecture of the nature were definitive and absolute for the condition and the definition of the project. Next. It was an absolute tension created between water and mountain, between, the, between interior and exterior, between mass and void, a, a tension that had to be reinterpreted in means of space and in means of materials. Next, please. It, 
Nevertheless, the, the two houses are, continue, are contiguous, I mean, and they are one next to each other. The conditions, the very particular conditions in within the generality of the, of the site condition made the variations of the same theme. The, condition, the topographical conditions, the orientations conditions, the light conditions, the conditions of, of the frictions, the tensions, of the tra and the tractions established by the different elements that were there before our work came to the place and before the work had the opportunity to interact with that place and to create a new place that is a product of the uh, marriage of the architectural object in the objects of nature, in the conditions of nature. Next, please. Next. Sunny, one is stuck. <laughs> this second project that I'm showing is a house we built in Mexico City, in one of the suburban areas of Mexico City. And uh, I, I, it's, I am showing these two projects together because being very similar programs, the, uh, the conditions of the site, the conditions of the place, the motivations were so extremely different that the response to that had to, to bring up these two uh, uh, different uh, projects. If I was talking about tensions among the different elements in the, first pl in, the, in the prior project, this is a project that was born not out of tensions, but out of frictions. In a very, very reduced site that was exposed um, uh, but proportionally, much more intensely to, to, uh, to, a, uh, to a site where movement was the main and the most important factor, both by the people, by the cars, and by the different natural elements. And that has, is what created or what uh, impulsed us into, the, into the, uh, trying to make this interpretation of an architecture that by definition, by definition of construction, is a matter or, or is an object of statics to become an object of dynamics. Next, please. The different planes that form this project are intended to respond to that uh, condition of constant move movement created by the perception of the architecture. Next. And when I mean uh, uh, by the perception of architecture, I, not, I mean by the whole experience of the, of, of the sequence of the, of the spaces. The whole uh, architecture as a line of sequence of different aesthetic space experiences that have to do with a certain place and a certain object. Next, please. Uh, in this, of course, uh, the relationships interior, exterior, light and shadow, uh, void and mass, all of them have to do with the conditions that somehow already existed or were given to us by the interpretation of the, of the actual conditions of the existing site before we came. In this specific case, uh, next please, it's, uh, it's probably worth it to mention that the topography was very important and what we had there when we got there was this one very tall wall, which is in this slide, in the right slide, the wall to the left, that was a retaining wall to an existing upper garden. So we started up from that first plane, and from that first plane, as one of the facts of the place, developed all of the other planes that had or tended to be different in order to create this uh, condition of dynamism and of movement. Next, please. Next. Uh, also, to, uh, 
in, in the same line of thought about place, uh, uh, I would like to, to mention another thing that have to do with the, with the next project. Uh, for us, it's, in, for architecture, or for those who practice architecture, I think it's most important the possibility to, the, to endow the environment with a new identity. That means to transform the place. As little or as small as our intervention could be in a certain location, the transformation of construction in any place is immense. And that is part of our big responsibility. Uh, this next project uh, is a project that was not built, that we designed. Uh, it's a, a project for a park that we designed in a site where uh, there was to be a, a commemoration, a, a, an event to honor 80 existing olive trees that were the first olive trees that were planted by the Spanish priests that came to America 500 years ago. And uh, those trees uh, fell into abandonment for multiple historic political reasons. And recently, there was an intent to uh, uh, regain uh, the meaning of the trees. And we had the opportunity to design uh, a park to commemorate the existence of those trees. we we'll go on, please. We found the possibility to understand the place not only as the existing topography or the conditions of the soil, but we could discover that the place had to do with many more other things. In this project, what we tried to do was to make an overposition, a transparent overposition of a different set of layers, of a different set of plants where each one of the plants could somehow uh, rediscover or reinterpret into, into geometry, into, uh, in, into abstraction, the capacities of the different conditions. And therefore, we started by taking the existing olive trees, next please, the, taking the existing olive trees and making out of the absolute uh, unrational a condition of the location of the trees one layer. By that, we would overimpose a new layer of new olive trees that would be to grow in the next 100 or 200 years. And therefore, we had the capacity to use a different order, a very rational order for those, for those olive trees. And then we decided to go on and on. And then we sort of, as we had already the soil and we had already the trees, we could also use the sky. So we decided, as uh, Mexico City has a very bad problem, uh, which is probably uh, as bad as yours or even worse, and I'm not talking about earthquakes, it's about smog, and uh, it's very hard to see the sky of Mexico City, we decided that we would take the layer of the sky and bring it down to the ground. So therefore, we took another layer that was another condition of the place, put it into, into a two-dimensional, bring it down, overlay it with the, with the other layers that we already had, and therefore we brought down the, st the, the stars into a non-rational or a non-orthodox geometrical plane to be overimposed over the others, and so forth and so forth. And then we took the circle that had to do with the with some more, uh, I would say, mythological, mythological conditions and the line that would unify the existing location with the location of a certain uh, place that had to be uh, uh, made uh, uh, like a, a, a brother of this place because that was the place where those trees had left from in space to come to this new land, to this new continent, to this new land. And we, st we started working with all of these conditions and let all of those, uh, next please. I'm, I'm sorry, I forget to say next and, and we stay too long in one, in one slide. Uh, and all of those conditions, next please, would, would allow us to start bringing out 
certain uh, possibilities for the design of this project. What we're looking at, uh, we decided that there would be very few uh, what we could orthodoxly call uh, architectural elements, uh, as for example this promenade that would be a commentary on the topography of the place. The place is so large that it seemed to be a very flat place. But we discovered that among the certain hundred meters to be, to be uh, followed, to be walked, uh, there was an important topograph topographical accident, a decline. So it was important for us to mention and to, to uh, bring out those conditions and again, as I said before, to make the new architecture react with that site condition to be transformed into a new place that would never be the same, but would have a lot to be changing forth as time goes by. Next, please. Next. Uh, again, following in this theme, uh, uh, I will now uh, show you a, a, another project that we are currently working on, and that has to do with a matter that it's one of the conditions of, of the place which has to do with topography. And it's probably one of the most important and sometimes most difficult uh, situations to be worked with. Uh, we were called to design in this, in this place, as you see it now, this is the way it is now, uh, a programmatic situation that uh, when, when we were first encountered with, uh, we realized it was a very atypical condition, not because the, the, the program and not because the site or not because the place, but because of the communion of both. We had a very, a place that is in a very accidented topographical situation. And what we, we were asked to do there is to design a, a group of car dealers. Next. I know it sounds funny, but it's very true. A, what happened here is that this is a new development in Mexico City, outside of Mexico City. And the planners, of course, the planners, all the planners are geniuses, as you know. Uh, they decided that uh, in their plans that uh, car dealers had no possibility of existence. It's a very, I believe that it's, uh, all of those plans are always a very a condition of fascist condition. So they decided car dealers could not exist in this place. So there were no car dealers marked on their plans. But of course, being at a very important development on a very important road, leaving Mexico City, a very important highway, the car dealers got together and started making an important pressure on the developers of the city. And the developers were forced that there was a absolutely uh, in unjustified because of an, an aesthetic condition, or more, I would say, an aesthetic presumption that they would be able to void the possibility of having a certain use in a certain place. So, uh, of course, they were very tricky, and they decided, okay, uh, okay, we will let them be, but they gave them this piece of land that I showed you before. The conditions for a car dealer, as you all know, uh, tip, uh, uh, typologically are very different. What we decided when we got this site, and uh, the site as you can see in the left hand sl slide, it's a very narrow, very long piece of land with an important topography as I showed you before. But worst of all is that only one, uh, like the big uh, side of the site, like the big facade, is not the site that is facing the important highway, but it's only the tip, the tip, the very last tip of the site, like the head of the fish there, that touches the, the freeway. And of course, it was very important for all of the five owners of the site to have that point. So the first question is, who would get the, that site? So next. What we decided is that we would build a tower on the point, that we will build a tower on the point of the site that is touching the freeway. And in that tower, we would put the showrooms for all of the five dealers. It would be a tower 
where people would come and would go with an elevator and they could go from one name or from one brand of cars to the next brand of cars. On the flat part, on the upper plateau of the site, we are putting all of, all of the, uh, where they, they do the work on the cars, where, where they do all of the repairs of the cars. Uh, next, please. And we, we decided, you can see the topographical conditions on the left side, and we decided as a third element that in order to get up there, we had to build a ramp. And the ramp was a very uh, expensive, it's a very expensive part of the investment that of course was not considered for car dealers w that are used to uh, spending not very much money in that. So we had to find out a, a possibility where we offer them uh, something that was out of the program that was this a corporative building in front uh, that would be at the same time the condition to build a ramp, help build a ramp. Constructively, it will be the retention wall of the ramp. And at the same time, what they are doing is they have sold or rented or leased or whatever that space to other people that also give services to the car industry, like people that like sell, uh, that like sell uh, tires or they sell accessories, different accessories, luxury accessories, or people that do give financial services to the car industry, like for leases of cars, etc., etc., etc. In that way, we were able to transform this absolute uh, uh, accidented conditions that would make an impossible a financial project like this to become financially pro profitable. And that, that's what's giving us the possibility to go on with this project. Next, please. Next, also right, please. Here are some images of the, of the showrooms, of the showrooms tower. Of course, it was also a very uh, a very provocative program that we had to invent because the possibility of dealing with a building where we had to have very important vertical uh, movements of cars uh, was very interesting. So the whole, the whole invention of the program became a very important motivation for the project. Next, please. Uh, the next issue or the next concern uh, I have called it the tectonics of, ar of architecture. And of course we understand the tectonic part of architecture as the expression of the activities or the systems or the processes of construction. But I think there is much more when I mean tectonics of architecture uh, than only the capacity or the possibility or, or the talent or the talent that is involved in putting some materials together in order to have a construction. Uh, once, once a friend, a, friend, uh, a friend of mine and a friend of many others who are here was telling me as we were walking in New York, we were leaving Colombia one day with, where we were teaching, and he said, isn't it incredible that uh, we, have we were out of our review we see so much talent in the schools, we see so much ideas, and by that of course he meant the students and he meant the faculty, and he said, and now here we're, we're riding in a taxi and in one of the most important cities of the world, and we see so little of that when we leave those uh, cathedrals of architectural thought. And of course what was behind uh, was, uh, what he meant was uh, because it takes so much to get architecture built. And I absolutely believe that the only, uh, uh, the only objective of architecture is to have it constructed. Uh, and that takes many of efforts that have to be put together and many of talents that have, been, have to be put together. And all of that that is so hard to, for me to describe it's what I, what I call the tectonics of architecture, the possibility of getting to the construction of architecture that for me is again the essence of our discipline. We have an obsession which is to be faithful to the materials and to the principles of construction. 
I am very fascinated by the world of materials. By, I, we dedicate a lot of our time to the exploration of possibilities and of new possible conditions of materials. And by that, I absolutely don't mean that we are dedicated to an investigation on high technology or on the ornamentation that can be achieved by construction. I think that technology, or we take technology, as something, as something that exists and surrounds us, and it's something that we accept as an everyday condition. Uh, I think that technology is a very natural fact of our time and of our places. And that is, I think, uh, one of the, of, the, of the feeding lines where we depart from. Next, please. We had the opportunity a couple years ago, we were invited to work in this project in downtown Mexico City. Uh, uh, as you may be very, aware, very well aware of, Mexico City was founded uh, or started flourishing uh, as an as a occidental city, I would call it, because of course the old Te Tenochtitlan existed there during the 16th century. And we have our oldest city, our old city is the colonial city, as this city was built on top of the pre-existing uh, Aztec city. So w I refer, we refer to the colonial city, to the colonial environment as the old core or the old part of our city. So we had the opportunity to, to build this project right in the, in the center, in the core of, of the colonial city, next to, a, to an existing 17th century church and across from a very beautiful uh, square, from a very beautiful plaza from the, from the same time. Uh, what for, for us was, uh, next please, next please. What for, all, for us was very challenging is that this was a project uh, where uh, we had a very, very restricted budget as this was, a, it, it's a housing for workers uh, that was uh, commissioned to us by one of the, of the government housing agencies. Uh, and I don't want to go very much into this, but of course it's a very reactionary uh, agency that is used to certain way of constructing things and to certain way of using materials and to certain materials to be used. Next, please. Our, uh, next, please. So our challenge was uh, to find out or to look for the opportunity to find materials that would be less expensive and at the same time could give us a better opportunity of use or a better opportunity of relationship or a better opportunity of putting them together, making them react against each other, uh, interweaving those materials, uh, experimenting with those materials that were sitting and lying right there in the corner, in the store in the corner, uh, in the hardware store in the corner, or in the brick store in the next corner, and that were not being used because of many, uh, of many uh, reasons uh, that are strange to architecture. Next, please. Next. Next. This next project, uh, which uh, I th again uh, uh, has to do with the same uh, thematics, uh, it's about materials, it's about the possibility of getting the materials together and about the possibility of the administration and the correctness of the materials. And uh, this brings to me another reflection, another thought that has to do with the, the, the materiality of architecture as an abstract and geometric system. The expression of gravity and weight, which is, after all, one of the very, very basics of our uh, profession, 
uh, the expression of gravity and weight of the constructive elements, the tensions of static behavior and the internal forces of each material. This is a project uh, that, uh, next please, that we built on a very uh, fascinating condition, which is that there was an existing structure and uh, these people, which is an important television network in Mexico, had the necessity to build a big hall, uh, a, a big hall that uh, it's like a huge cafeteria, a huge cafeteria, and they had no room because they have already built their whole site. So we, after looking a little bit, we decided there existed a, a, a parking structure, and that's what the model on the left shows. Uh, there existed a, a parking structure, and that was the only possibility of a site that we had for the size of the building these people needed. So the place we got was a plateau, a man-made plateau, that its conditions were so delicate because it's a, it was an already finished structure that very hardly, very hardly could allow any introduction of a new system or a new way because of what you are also very aware and it's also very contemporary now in Los Angeles because of seismic conditions. So we had to design a building that would be a very light building and light building in all of the senses of, of, of the word light uh, that had to be barely, that could really barely land on the existing structure and the existing structure had already certain uh, demanding geometrical conditions that also were an absolute uh, 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 base for this project. Next, please. Uh, another issue, of course, was that not only the structural and the, the, the uh, construction process of this, of this project, uh, but also the, the necessity of, a, of an image or the capacity of a new image that this client of us uh, demanded from this building. And of course, it was the transformation of a very run down, abandoned, uh, abandoned structure into a new building that had to do, or that had to, to let them feel a, as part or of their own process. So we decided to, to add a, a, a new space that would end up in this huge screen where images are being shown and the images keep in constant transformation the building. A, in the people that leave the studios, because this is where the TV studios are, enter through the, Im through the moving image into a totally different environment. Like they leave the production of the living image through the living image into the new environment. Next, please. Next. 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 Again, the possibility of the use of the different materials, the possibility of the use of the structural conditions, the possibility of the interpretation of the way that gravity affects different each of the materials that are to be used become uh, our aesthetic palette, becomes uh, our possibilities of, of expressing uh, a condition, an aesthetic condition, or a will of creative condition. Next, please. Next. Are, are we out of focus in one of the slides or no? Well, next, maybe it's only because I'm too close. Next. Uh, the, the expression of the interior and the possibility of the interior, like the geometry of it, uh, has to do absolutely 
with the, the conditions that we have already found, not only in the place, but also in the possibilities of construction, the possibilities of materials, and the, and the structural conditions. Next. Next. Next, please. Okay. Uh, besides that, and to add up to this theme of te tectonics, uh, we have also worked very much in the conditions uh, of the of the different layers and the different skins that tend to form a building, where each skin of material conserves its own characteristics. It's an add up. It's a superposition of different skins. For each skin talking about an, its own language and uh, it's superimposed on each other. And the transparency of this superimposition, uh, superimposition of the tectonic conditions of these skins is what gives the image or the, new voc or the vocabulary to the new building. Uh, this project, it's a large project that uh, we don't know if it will be built. We, we are afraid it won't by, the, by now. It's a, a it's a proposal for a market, a marketplace in Mexico City. Next, please. Uh, where what we got was a very narrow strip of land that was leftover land of when, they, when the city decided to build up uh, the, this important uh, street of the city. It, this was a very narrow street. So they decided to buy the houses of one side of the street, but they didn't end up using the whole space for the street. And a whole uh, line of existing empty lots uh, were proposed for, the, for this uh, new project. The idea was to give to the, to, the site, to the street vendors of Mexico City uh, a reorganization, a possibility of, uh, of owning their own uh, marketplaces in a very new and dynamic and representative uh, building of the uh, contemporary conditions of the city. Next, please. Uh, th this uh, uh, project, uh, maybe it's good to say, is located in a, in a neighborhood, in an area of the city that has a very strong market tradition uh, that has been known as one of the markets of the city for many of years, as it was a, a, a place since the Aztec days that united the, the center of Tenochtitlan and the center of Tlatelolco, that were two important neighboring towns. And this was the marketplace that related both of them. So there is a very old tradition of of market, of street vendors. It's like the bazaar of the city. Uh, and uh, of course, there is a very strong and strict uh, political organization be behind all of that. In this project, next please, was born from the will of those people to, to go ahead and be contemporary which was something very uh, interesting uh, in this whole process of design. Next. Next. Next, please. The next theme, or the next part, uh, is what I have called uh, uh, our concern with a condition that has been in in, and this is where I, I can take Betsky's introduction, a condition that has been a very modern condition to architecture, which I have called the condition of abstraction and rationality. I understand this as an anti-illusionist, inexpressive attitude that seeks essentially by means of the absence of decorative elements and a reliance on primary geometric structures. We attempt to strip away all allusion, to free our work from all referential, representative, or metaphoric functions. It should not appeal nor evoke anything that is not itself. Uh, I am going to use the project that also Aaron mentioned at the beginning, which is the, uh, what we have called the 
eh, centro de iluminación, it's something like illumination center. And this is the, I would say, the very first, eh, the very first project of our, of our team, of our office. And it was, next please. This was designed, eh, it's really a, a renovation of an existing structure eh, that, eh, in, uh, in a very tiny site in Mexico City. And the whole idea was really to strip away the building, next, to strip away the building from any figurative or any uh, meaningful element that, as you can probably imagine, that's all this building was about, and leave it, bring it to its basics, and then have the possibility to add or to make interact or to make a, a, a react the building with new elements of abstraction that could create a language uh, that would be suitable for this uh, building that would be to become a showroom for lighting fixtures. Next, please. And uh, that's what uh, it's all about. It's, uh, we had the possibility of doing the interiors, on working with furniture, in working with materials, in working with the existing elements and the new elements. Uh, next, please. Next. Uh, I also believe in this condition of abstraction and, and rationality that one of the most important resources has been uh, the formal and ethical possibility of repetition. And that is uh, also adding to this, trying to inspire emotion with the repetition of few elements on the basis of pure experience. Uh, this is a project that we have finished uh, a couple years ago in Mexico City. And it's a competition we won. Uh, and it, what it houses, it's a very small uh, cultural center in a very uh, typical urban condition. In a, one of those, uh, I would say, forgotten areas of the city. So the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a small cultural center that acts both as uh, has the possibility of, of being a school, it has classrooms, teaching center, etc., but also the possibility to bring in certain expressions of culture to, uh, the, to the neighborhood that lacks very much of these amenities. Uh, next, please. The whole, the whole project, the whole idea, uh, as, we, as this started and because we wanted to do it and we wanted to win it, is that we had to find a system that would be very easy, very easy to repeat it, and by repeating it in an industrial way means an uh, inexpensive possibility of construction, and that would also allow or would have the, cap the capacity of inviting the accidents that would differentiate it from uh, other, other buildings. Next, please. Uh, of course, uh, we dealt a lot with the possibility of circulations and with the relationships that uh, the, the getting to know a building, that going through a construction, uh, uh, the sequence of the, of the experimentation, the sequence of the, of the aesthetic possibilities has to do with the overimposition of the different appreciations of the building. And that's where the accidents to the repetitive system became a part of this project. Next, please. Next. Next, please. Next. Next. Uh, we think uh, that our work, or I believe that our work, is, is a work that tries to speak to the intellect, uh, that refers to the paradigm of reason. Uh, 
I think that we elude all sensualist contamination going beyond the pure perception of, of forms, uh, trying to free it for, of subjective prints. Uh, this project uh, is a, a competition that we lost and therefore it will not be built, uh, where the program was uh, uh, what, what the clients called uh, a children's museum. Uh, I hesitate, next please, I hesitate very much to call it a museum because I don't believe that, a, that something like a, a building, a construction like this, it has to do with the traditional or the, with the traditional typology of a museum because it's more uh, what, what they call it a hands-on experience, uh, something like Sayark sort of. Uh, of course, uh, we only came to the schematics, but it was a very important experiment to us that had to deal uh, precisely on the possibility of 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 the volumes and the forms and the interaction of these very abstract and platonic elements that could deal with each other uh, and with every one of the others in different conditions, in different of attractions, in different uh, in conditions of attraction, in con different in conditions of repellence, in conditions of collision. Uh, there were various the differences that would. Uh, uh, intervene in the conception of this project and that of course had to do with the very specific conditions both of the place where it was located next please and the possibilities of the construction next please and what we uh, what we tried here was to create uh, the relationship this this play this museum which is now built by one of my colleagues, uh, is located at the very edge of an important park in Mexico City. And the whole theme was about the relationships with the, be, within the park and the city, within the leisure and the, and the density of the city, and, and the stress, I mean the leisure and the, the stress of the city. And it's about, of course, the density of the city and the possibility of going away from, from that uh, uh, density. Next, please. Next. Uh, this is a project uh, which we have now on their construction and that will help me uh, exemplify uh, the next theme that is uh, uh, another one of our important concerns and what, uh, it's something I have called unity. It's, it's a matter of unity. And again, I think, as, as all of the rest, as all of the others one I have referred to, are themes that are themes of our modern condition, are themes of modernity, that are giving us, giving us the opportunity of, of reinterpretation and rediscovery. And by unity, uh, I don't mean uh, what uh, has, at least when I went to school, it's something that was to me very much stressed of the possibility of, of unity, of a one, of a wholeness of a project. But I understand unity as a different unity. It's a unity of rupture. It's a unity that it's at the same time open and discontinuous and fragmentary and dynamic over all things. Uh, next, please. It, it, this project that, that, as I said, is halfway built now, is, is, the, is the official school of drama, the school of theater in Mexico City. It, and it's located in the southern part of Mexico City in a very important uh, uh, vehicular uh, intersection. Uh, what we have done, uh, it's, a, very, it's a, a, a building, it's a construction that, was, that what was so inspiring and so motivating to us is that it has an incredibly complex program that it's formed by very various uh, uses and functions. The possibility of putting all of those uh, elements together and giving uh, and stacking together all of the different elements 
and each of the elements gives a personality to a very different activity and to a very different condition. Next. And then uh, the, the capacity of inventing a form, an abstract form, a clear geometric form that would uh, uh, give them a certain unity, but it's a unity, what, it, what it's doing is putting the, those elements in motion giving those elements the possibility of interaction and of reaction. It's not the unity, it's not a form that seeks uh, for, for uh, staticism, but it's a form that gives a new space or a different space that allows in the void the possibility of the reaction of the masses. Next, please. Next. Of course, uh, what, uh, we, we had a very restrict, restricted site uh, for a, also for a very large uh, uh, for a very large program. So the opportunity of stacking of stacking those elements, of putting them one on top of the other and one side to side to the other, and having them all touching, some touching, some barely touching, some others intersecting some others penetrating other elements, <coughs> was a great opportunity for the investigation of this condition. Next. Next, please. And the last project uh, that uh, I brought, and it's also a project that we have recently uh, started the construction of it, uh, uh, and that has to do with the, with the same theme, uh, is, is uh, a project for, for the same client that we did before, the, the big hall, the cafeteria on top of the parking structure that I showed you. And this is in a different one of their, of their locations, a, a very urban location. They decided again to have a project that would bring together a whole bunch of very different activities. So in, an, in a one structure, in a one uh, block of the city, next please. In one block of the city, we are bringing together uh, various things that go from parking, from medical services, from where they pay their employees, from a bank, uh, and then a cafeteria and kitchens, and a health club, and conference room. It's a very mixed uh, project that, uh, again, uh, if in the other, in, in the project before, what it was about, it's about the possibility of uh, interacting and, and putting in a constant movement, in a violent movement, a group of volumes, a group of masses. In this case, uh, within the same realm of thought, what we are trying to do is use it, but to, to put in that motion a set of planes and of lines. Here, the spaces are defined by different planes and by different lines. And then, again, the invention of a geometry, of an abstraction that allows us to react uh, all of those elements in within or against each of, each of one of those elements. Next, please. Uh, in this case, as I said before, it's a very urban condition. Uh, it's a block of the city, a block that it's very close to the center of Mexico City, although it's right at the edge of the, of the colonial core, of the old core that I mentioned before. It's, a, it's an element that becomes a very defined, a very uh, uh, absolute condition in, a, in that beautiful chaos that is the, that is the, the modern city. Next, please. This is a view of the, of the main space. Next. 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 I don't have more projects, but I have some, just a few lines or a few words that I have to, that I would like to, to comment with you and then I'll open a discussion if there is any or if you're willing. Uh, something that I have uh, 
that I worry that we think a lot, that we discuss a lot with our team, is the, the role of, of our generation, uh, not only as a generation of architects, not a generation of people dedicated to architects, but what is the role or, or what is the, the position of this generation of creators uh, that I think I and many of, the, of you that are here uh, belong to. I think, and I'm convinced, that there, it's happening, uh, there is a new consoli consolidation of the tradition of modern architecture. Modernity has shown this, pos this capacity uh, to be a system that appears, disappears, and reappears, and reappears uh, more than anything. It's a system that has the capacity of reinventing itself every day. I think, uh, or I believe, that that's part of what we are trying to do. Th that reconsolidation, that uh, materialization of a new stage of this modernity that still has so much to give. Uh, I believe in a, a new possibility for modern architecture that it's free of dogmas and free of rights, that it's much more rooted to the humanist tradition. I think that what we need is an architecture based on a necessary reduction, a, ration, a rationalization and sanitation of the postures in current architecture. I think that we have to seek for the essence of architecture, an architecture that really is committed and wants to revise its basic problems. I think it's an architecture that arises in a period of great crises and recessions, and that we are committed to the reduction of squander of all types. And I am absolutely convinced that there is a real alternative for us. And thank you very much. Yeah. I can barely hear you. I have to repeat your question because if not, it's not recorded or something like that. So, so your question is uh, how much, uh, when, I, when I speak about materials, uh, I am talking about a reaction to the conditions of Mexico City, to resume. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I very truly believe, though, that uh, the, the the world uh, uh, is becoming so small and is becoming so close together and uh, uh, that uh, it's very hard to call any architecture, and sorry because I know others don't think like that, uh, I find it very difficult to call an architecture the architecture of Mexico or the architecture of Los Angeles or a reaction to the architecture of Paris or to the conditions of, of, of Tokyo or whatever. Uh, I, tr I truly believe that uh, what modernity, what modern thought has brought us is this capacity of, of a universal condition for the creation of the arts. Uh, of course, there are cer certain shades 
uh, that uh, are permeable uh, through my upbringing, through my very personal conditions, <laughs> that have to do with a light and with a soil where I was brought up. But I, I, for me, it's very hard to answer and to try to call my architecture a, a Mexican architecture because it's built in Mexico City, which are two different things. You know, if, if it's the architecture that is built in Mexico City, uh, then I would say yes. But I think, uh, to, to go into more precisely into the, the, your question, I think that uh, it's not a reaction uh, to what is happening in Mexico City, because I don't think that what's happening in Mexico City is so different of what's happening here in Los Angeles or what's happening in, in Tokyo. So I would say that uh, me or other of my colleagues uh, uh, that are working in architecture, of course, are reacting at the same time to their own cities, but the cities being a universal phenomena, being an event, a universal event, an international event. And I believe that the city is, as I say, the city. And it's not much difference between one and another. Maybe the city in Mexico, of Mexico and the city of Los Angeles and any other one, the city of El Cairo or the city of Beijing, will one day become the city. And that will be the city, and it's a reaction against the city. If, if that's more or less what you are asking, I don't know. I wouldn't know that. I also wonder. Yes. How do, do does my architecture engage politics? Uh, when I mentioned that, uh, I knew that would come up. We are, uh, of course, uh, I think that we are used to, to understand politics as, a, uh, as this system or, or, or these conditions that bring certain people to certain hierarchical positions of power. No? And that has to do very directly with the interaction of the people that get involved in, in government or in administration conditions. Uh, uh, I do think there is a, a condition of a, of a power struggle, but it's not under the same rules of wha as what it's played, uh, here it's very easy to say, like in Washington, no, because it's very concentrated. I think when I say it's a political condition, it's a, a political that has to do with the aesthetics and that has to do with the, with the conditions of expression of course in a hierarchical way, and of course in a system of power, but that plays with rules that are not described in the same way as in the administration. There's a different, different realm, uh, I would like to believe, that have to do with the politics or the, the struggle of power that has to do with the vocabulary of the aesthetics, that it's not the, 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 the same struggle that has to do with the power of the of reaching for a better administrative position, uh, it's very hard for me to explain that. But uh, maybe somebody else can explain it better. Well, 
as far as of what has been the response, I have to admit it. Uh, I, th I think it has been a good response because we keep on having work. You know? <laughs> and that's a, a way probably of measuring that. But I know that's not where your, where your question is going. Uh, can you repeat the first part, please? Yeah, of course, of, oh, I'll come back to the point of contextualism, but I'll, I'll ask you the, the, the last part. Yeah, of course it has brought up a, a, a certain reaction, especially when, when the buildings are, are set up in more, uh, in more protected or, or in certain areas of, of the cities or, 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 or of the country that people would like to see it in more of a nostalgic way, you know, but that, that I think is something that happens in, in many of places. It, it doesn't happen here because there, it, there doesn't exist, I believe, such an area of the city of Los Angeles that people could look at it uh, with such conditions. Uh, so yes, it has brought up uh, many arguments and it has brought up uh, any kind of criticism. But this brings up something that interests me uh, a lot. Uh, in, in where I practice in Mexico City, but I've encountered this same co discussion in different European forums uh, that have to deal with, with what they call not only contextualism, but a very strange word that they call identity. You know, and people would ask me, uh, because that building or, or your work or whatever uh, doesn't have the identity or it's not part of an identity. Uh, so th that's uh, brought me to think of, of what that means. And I truly believe that identity in architecture, it may be extended to other realms of creation, but I truly believe that in architecture, that identity has to do with the capacity to responding to a very unique and local condition. And every case, every uh, programmatic situation, every uh, site uh, situation that we encounter with probably will bring out a very different response. And the identity is uh, precisely in the capacity of that reaction. That, of course, for many of people that think that way, uh, uh, would, would try to put it in, in a, or use a word called eclecticism. You know, the, the, uh, an eclectic body of work. But I think that, uh, that that's not a, a, as a negative uh, criticism, but as a good criticism when people refer to that, because that means that each one of the situation has been treated because the conditions that existed and that were interpreted are different to any other condition. So that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, I, I, I used the word a couple of times. You're very, uh, I have to repeat that. If not. You're asking about the word dynamism, right? Like, what does that mean to me? And uh, what, what I'm going to tell you, not, uh, it's, I, I wouldn't say it, uh, what it means only in my work, but because I can find that in, in the work of many of my colleagues that, uh, that maybe they don't use the word, but. Uh, of course, uh, there is a contradiction, as I, and I mentioned before, uh, when you speak about architecture, because one of the, the basic uh, conditions of architecture, that it's, it's an art that uh, 
it's not moving. No? It's an art that has to do with the statics uh, as a physical condition of architecture. But uh, uh, in, uh, that has to do with a whole uh, way of thought or a whole philosophy, the, the static part, that was uh, broken, that has been broken and that has been really uh, challenged uh, in the art of our century. I believe in architecture. One, of course, and the very simple uh, answer would be is the possibility of trying to put together an experience through movement. Like it's an experience, architecture is an experience that uh, uh, you don't uh, have uh, if, you are, if, you, if you are standing, if you are static. Okay, and then if you have two parts, one is the observer and one, uh, one is the observed object, and then the observer, the object cannot move, but the observer can move. That, that would be one explanation. And then there is a dynamism, which uh, it was not necessarily true in, in all of the classical architecture of before. It may have been in other conditions, but not in the, in the classical architecture. But what I'm very much interested is sometimes in, in those possibilities of an architecture that is static, but that implies movement. It's an architecture that through different uh, compositive conditions implies something that is not absolutely stable, or that is not apprehended by the observer through movement as a stable condition. And then you can have both the observer and the object, or, or try to have both the observer and the object, both in movement. Although, of course, uh, architecture is a physically static object, if that explains. Well, I guess we can go for a beer then.